This video describes the technique of minimally invasive separation of components without the need for laparoscopy. Separation of components aims to improve the outcomes of incisional hernia repair by allowing for complete medialization of the rectus muscle and reapproximation of the linea alba. In this technique, the aponeurosis is divided just lateral to the rectus muscles. The rectus muscles are then medialized. This allows for placement of posterior mesh, followed by sutured reapproximation of the linea alba. The traditional approach to separation of components involves starting at the hernia site and then working laterally. The problem is that this approach interrupts all of the perforators to the medial aspect of the skin. In some patients, this results in skin flap necrosis, which is a major source of morbidity. Here we describe a technique for separation of components with preservation of the perforators. The patient is a 49-year-old man with recurrent incisional hernia. Synthetic mesh had been placed previously. He had multiple risk factors for skin flap necrosis, including morbid obesity, diabetes, and a smoking history. Step one of the operation is to open the old vertical midline incision, separate the hernia sac from the small bowel loops, and then separate the visceral block from the anterior abdominal wall. This involves a lysis of adhesions and complete removal of the prior mesh. It is important to avoid enterotomy or cirrhosal injury during this dissection. The next step in the dissection is to elevate a lipocutaneous flap around the fascial defect in all directions. Five centimeters of anterior rectus sheath is separated away from the overlying subcuticular tissues. In creating the flap, you frequently must incise through scar tissue and old hernia sac. The next step is to remove any unwanted hernia sac and divide the linea alba right along the medial border of the rectus muscle. This freshens up the edge and may allow for improved wound healing. Now we are ready to make a minimally invasive separation of components. This can be done by making two transverse incisions, each five centimeters in width. The location of the incisions are shown here. The incision should be centered about halfway between the costal margin and the iliac crest. The center of the incision correlates to a point two centimeters lateral to the lateral border of the rectus sheath. In this view, we are making the transverse incision. The width of the incision is the width of a small Richardson retractor. We are operating on the right side of the patient. Dissection is then carried down through the subcutaneous fat until the aponeurosis of the external oblique is encountered. Here's the view from the surgeon's eye. Once you get down to the aponeurosis, you can carefully palpate and identify the lateral border of the rectus sheath. It is very important to be one to two centimeters lateral to the lateral border of the rectus sheath. The next step is to create a tunnel in a sagittal plane immediately above the aponeurosis. The key instrument for success here is a renal vein retractor. You use the tip of the retractor to bluntly dissect and then use electrocautery to clean off the anterior surface of the aponeurosis. Inferiorly, you continue almost to the inguinal canal. Superiorly, the tunnel extends in a sagittal plane to a point several centimeters above the costal margin. The next step in the operation is to divide the aponeurosis of the external oblique starting at a point one to two centimeters lateral to the lateral border of the rectus sheath. This is a critical point in the operation. The aponeurosis of the internal oblique lies directly underneath and it is important not to divide that structure. Once the space is entered, a right angle can be used to retract it anteriorly and the aponeurosis is divided with cautery.
you can use a combination of palpation and inspection to identify the correct location to open the aponeurosis. Once the incision has been started, it is straightforward to continue it along the subcutaneous tunnel. This is done with an assistant holding the renal vein retractor, exposing the aponeurosis. The surgeon then uses a long handle Schnick clamp and a bovie with an extender tip and divides the aponeurosis along the entire length. Superiorly, the end point of this dissection is a point just above the costal margin. Inferiorly, you want to stop just before you get to the inguinal canal. Once the aponeurosis has been opened, the next step is to divide the connective tissue between the external oblique and the internal oblique. This plane is completely avascular and also devoid of nerves. In many patients, it separates just with blunt dissection from the tip of a finger. That completes the release of the rectus muscles. The next step is to perform a similar maneuver on the opposite side and then suture in mesh to repair the fascial defect. We typically will implant our mesh as an underlay using U stitches placed with five centimeters of overlap with the fascia. This is shown here. We generally use polypropylene mesh even in cases where there is contamination. Next, sutures are placed along the medial borders of the rectus muscle and are tied together, and this reapproximates the linea alba. If there is too much tension on the tissues, you can create a fenestration along the anterior rectus sheath to release the tension. The operation is completed by placing drains over the fascia and then closing dead space. We use 3-0 polysorb sutures from the lipocutaneous flap down through the reconnected linea alba and then back through the subcuticular tissues and tie them down in order to close dead space. We place one additional drain below the fascia and then place a drain in each of the two lateral release spaces. The skin is closed and that completes the operation. The benefit of this operation is that separation of components can be performed with about 20 minutes per side and no need for laparoscopic equipment. It's a very easy technique that anyone could master.